Let's pray first. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. Thank you for your spirit who teaches us your word, Lord, and and thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Matthew 22, verse 15 through 22. This is the passage. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. For thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the thing which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they heard those words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Okay, now for a little bit of context, the Lord Jesus has just finished speaking to the, to the, to the Pharisees, that's the people here. He spoke to them through a parable of a king who made a wedding for his son. That was in the past verses. And the parable focused, that parable of the wedding of the king's son, it focused on two groups of people. And then on a lone person who just happened to slip in to the wedding. The first group of people that were there that were the, that, that were focused on were those who were invited to the wedding and they were close to the palace of the king and therefore they were expected to be invited. They were expected to come to the wedding and the shock was how that whole group showed such a disrespect to the king they just refused to come to the wedding and they had these trivial pursuits or trivial distractions that they well, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. So the Pharisees knew from that that Christ was referring to them in the parable. The disrespect that that group showed to the king by not coming to the wedding that, that, that tried the king's patience. But the king was very gracious and he overlooked their first refusal, and then he sent another wave of servants to invite that same group to come to the wedding. And again, the group confirmed their refusal to and their stubbornness against the king and his son, and it was th that was so great that they didn't come. And that infuriated the king, which drove the king to invite the second group of persons to the wedding, and the second group was taken from those who were not close to the palace, but out in the highways with the picture uh, being that maybe they, they, they were not living close to the palace and maybe they were going to be far away but they, uh, and, and they just happened to be on a highway when the king's servants found them, invited. But they came. They came to the wedding. And the second group represented the Gentiles who were far from God but somehow they heard about the God of the Jewish people and how the God of the Jewish people was now inviting them to come to him. And the fact that these Gentiles came to the wedding was a condemnation to the first group that didn't come because the, the second group accepted. But then there was another person in that parable, a very, very unusual case here that is described, this other the lone person is described as someone who just happened to slip in to the wedding. He just happened to be there and he was caught by the king as a person who was not supposed to be at the wedding ceremony. Why? Because the problem was this person was not dressed in his best. He had all dirty work clothes on and, and he probably wasn't clean himself and he showed a great disrespect to the king. And this second person represents a person who tries to get into heaven dressed in his good works as a person and not dressed in the provided righteousness of Christ, which is symbolized by the wedding garment. And there are many people who are just enthralled with serving others. They're so caught up with serving others. They're, made, they're so caught up with making other people happy 
It's like they're almost intoxicated with how good they feel when they serve other people and they just become kind of drunk with the idea that surely they're going to be allowed into heaven because other people have been really happy with them and what they've done for him. And, and these people don't feel the need of Jesus Christ to, to get into heaven. Kind of reminds me of a, of, a, of a rabbi's wife that I spoke to last week. As you know, Passover was last week. And she was telling me, uh, uh, you know, she, uh, uh, she was telling me about all the things that she was doing. She was cooking for 200 people, making matzo balls and, and soup and everything. And she was going through all the recipes and stuff like that. And she was going on and on, you know. And, 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 and she said, and how are you? And I said, well, I'm recovering from surgery. She never heard that. She just was going on and on. And it's almost an intoxication that people get with, with their service. This is the person who was represented by the one who slipped into the wedding without being dressed for the wedding ceremony, and he was cast out into a horrible place called darkness, which represented hell. So the last person in this parable taught that in God's sight, all of our good works that a person can do are filthy in his sight, from Isaiah 64, 6. Such an important verse. Isaiah 64, 6, where it says, we are all as an unclean thing, in all our righteousnesses, every good thing we can do, everything we think, oh, whoa, that really. Is. No, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. In God's sight, there's only one clothing that looks good on a person, and that's the clothing of the righteousness of Christ, as it says in Romans 13 14. Romans 13 14 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61.10, when he, Isaiah 61.10, Isaiah's talking about how I look good because he looks at himself and he says in Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And when Christ finished this parable in verse 14, from this parable, the Pharisees got four points. That's what he was shooting to them. Four points. Number one, that the Pharisees were invited, as the Jewish people were, the Pharisees were invited to come to God to honor God's Son, Jesus Christ, and they refused. Point number two, that the Pharisees who were, were invited by multiple persons to come to God to honor Jesus Christ, and they refused every single one and therefore God was infuriated with them. Point number three, that God then turned to the Gentiles to invite them to come to God to honor Jesus Christ, and the Gentiles accepted and came to God. And point number four, God would not accept the good works of, any, uh, of the Pharisees to allow them to come to heaven. Those were the four points that Christ pitched to the Pharisees through this parable. Those were them. And... The Pharisees understood that Christ was talking to them. But he, they also understood that he, what he was saying to them were in the ears of the people too. That's what really got to them. This left the Pharisees infuriated at Christ that he had put them down in the front of the people and really made the Pharisees, they were so angry with that, with, that, with, that the people heard Christ say these things against them. So the Pharisees wanted then to invalidate Christ in the eyes of the people. And that was what made the, the Pharisees, was what triggered this meeting in verse 15. In verse 15 where it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. <coughs> so the Pharisees, they that were thinking only about themselves, not of the people, and for them, the problem was not what they heard Christ say about them. For them, the problem was that the people heard what Christ had said about the Pharisees. And so their goal next was to embarrass Christ in front of the people. And the goal became to force Christ into saying something that he didn't want to say. Now, here comes their plan. And their plan goes into action in verse 16. Verse 16, so they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, treat us the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any person, thou regardest not the, the, person, the, uh, not the, the, the person of men. 
So first of all, we see that there was this other group that they had corralled in, and they're called the Herodians, the Herodians. Now, the Herodians were Jews, and they were loyalist. They were loyal to Herod. They actually wanted for the king of Israel to be one of the descendants of Herod. And the Herodians were like inside informers. They were spies that Herod had used to know everything that was happening among the Jews. The Herodians were very dangerous people. They were very dangerous because the Herodians were the eyes and the ears of Herod, a very brutal, savage type of man among the Jews, the Herodians were. And it was exactly for this reason that the Pharisees invited the Herodians to go with the disciples of the Pharisees to, to have this encounter with Jesus. So sending the Herodians was a trap. And because the Herodians were the snare that the Pharisees set in place to trap Christ in his words. Now, they've got the Herodians in place, and the Pharisees are working to set up Christ for the big fall. This is a setup. And now, the, now, 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 now we really see the Pharisees as the fox putting on the sheep's clothing, as the Pharisees try to become like the Jewish people who were listening there, the, the, the multitude of the Jewish people, and the multitude of the Jewish people, they're following Christ as they first, and, and so the, the Pharisees don't want to position themselves as being the enemies and the opponents of Christ. No, so instead, they come in, in verse 16, with this word, master. Master. And I don't know, maybe Christ would, would, might, might have fallen off his feet when he heard him say that, master. Because the word means instructor. It means teacher. And they want to appear just like the others who saw Christ as their instructor. So they would become for the people, what they want to do is become for the people an example of a person who followed Christ and then left following Christ. They want to become a Templeton. I'm off with Billy Graham. They want to, they want to be a person who, who kind of paves a path to leave Christ. That's their strategy. It reminds me of a rabbi who's, who, who used to tell me, Tom, he used to tell me, I really want to follow Christ. So just help me with a couple of problems that I have about Christ. And then the rabbi would ask different, would bring out different portions of the New Testament that he thought were contradicting each other. And the reality was, he didn't want to follow Christ at all, but he said that he did just in order to get me on his side so that I could, I, I could see, oh yeah, the New Testament is really not true. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing here when they call Christ master, master, in verse 16. Christ is not their master. They're just calling Christ master in order to appear like they're following Christ. But he's not their master. They just called him master, just like a person today can call Christ Lord when Christ is not at all their Lord. And because there's one factor that makes Christ a person's Lord or that makes Christ a person's master, and he identified it in Luke 6.46, like Luke 6.46 when he said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I, which I say? So what makes a person, uh, what, makes, what, makes, what makes Christ a person's Lord is not that the person calls Christ his Lord. It's not that the person knows the Bible and can quote portions by heart of the Bible. It's not that the person regularly attends church. It's not that the person has been baptized or confirmed in the church. What makes a person, what makes Christ a person's Lord is that he does what Christ taught to do. He reads the Bible to find out what Christ is telling him to do. Uh, that person, when he opens the Bible, he maybe has a pen in his hand, and he maybe has some paper, and he says to himself, okay, I'm excited now, because today I know I'm going to find something in this book, in the Bible, that Christ is saying for me to do, and I'm going to write it down. And, the, and, and that's going to be, for me, my new instructions for today. That, that's going to be my project for today. So that's what a person looks like who really has Christ as his Lord. That's the picture. He's on the hunt for a command or an instruction that he just hasn't yet incorporated into his life. 
And he wants to incorporate the commands, the instructions of Christ into his life. This is the last thing on the mind of these Pharisees. They have no intention of doing that. And Christ went on to explain what it's like for a person to call him Lord, and here's what his instruction, and and he said uh, to do and not to do. He said in in Luke 646, that passage, Luke 646, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show uh, show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Both persons built a house. Both houses looked the same. Both houses were beautiful. Both houses looked like they were strong. Both houses looked like they were sturdy. Both houses looked like they're going to last 100 years and withstand whatever storm came its way. But the point was that outwardly, you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell the difference between one house built on the rock and the other house was built on the earth, the sand. Both houses look the same. One house just looked as strong as the other. Same size, same material, same windows, same doors. No difference between the two houses. And you and I would have said both houses are the same. That's all. But there was a huge difference in the houses, and the difference was not seen. It was not apparent to the eye. Because the difference was buried under the ground where you couldn't see there. You couldn't see that one house was built on the rock and the other house was built on the sand or the earth. You could could not know that because the rock is under the ground. Both houses were heavy. So if you pushed on the houses, neither house moved. One was as solid to you, looked as solid as the other. But the difference was that one house, the builder said to himself, I'm not building this house just for show. I'm not building a house here, to, 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 j- just for the temporary, I'm building a house for when the storm comes. I'm building a house to last forever. It would be a whole lot easier for me, the builder would say, it'd be a whole lot easier for me, a whole lot cheaper, just to, 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 to set the foundation of my house on sand, on dirt, and be done with it, and have my house look just as good as all the other houses, but not me. I'm not that kind of builder. I'm building for keeps. I'm going to dig down and dig down and dig down and dig down until I hit rock. And that's what I'm going to set the foundation of my house on, solid rock, because I know the storms can come. Now, by contrast, the other builders said, time is money. Time is money, and I want a quick house to go up. I'm not going to spend my strength and my time digging down to a rock. My house will look just as good as everyone else's houses, and, and, and we never get those strong storms so my, my, my quick-to-build house on the sand is going to be just fine and up when his house. And then it happened. Then it happened, that, that so-called 100-year storm, whatever they call it. It came, and, and the house on the rock looked just as strong as when it was constructed, but the house on the sand, well, it was all broken up, just piles, just piles of materials. And people then walked by the two houses and said, well, now we know. Now we know who took the time and the trouble to make sure that their house was built on the rock and who said it, and now we know who said it doesn't matter and built his house, house easily, more easily. And Christ said that that was the one difference between a person who just hears Christ's words, instructions, and doesn't bother to change his life to obey what Christ said. He built his house on the sand. And for that person, that was no problem until the storm came until that storm came. But for the other person who took the time and trouble to make sure his house was built on the rock, he built his house with that storm in mind. And when that storm did come, he said, just as I expected, and his house stood. And Christ said that that's like the person who not only heard what Christ said, but also did it. All because he built his house with the storm in mind. It reminds me of what happened in Loretto. You know, I sleep with earplugs. 
Don't ever call me at night. I'll never hear the phone and they won't get an answer. Anyway, about four years ago, as I was asleep with my earplugs on and I, and I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and so I put one foot down on the floor and splish splash, my foot was in water. And so, you know, you kind of sleep and I thought, well, maybe it was just a dream. Maybe I spilled some water or something like that. So I put my other foot down on the ground and splish splash, you know, it was <laughs> the house was flooded downstairs and upstairs. And uh, there had been a, a unexpected two hour hurricane with winds that were very strong and they, they blew the rain sideways into the, and then they came through the sliding glass doors and the windows <coughs> of the house that faces the ocean. And so I called my friend at two in the morning. We spent the rest of the night and the, uh, the, getting the water out of the house. And, 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 I, and as a consequence, I changed all the doors, all the doors and the windows to the ones that come from Florida that withstand <laughs> 150 mile an hour winds with rain, you know. And, and for the, the new retreat house, the new beach house, you know, building that house for the Category 5 hurricane, you know. The, the, the Category 5 hurricane John that did come and stayed in Loretto for two days in September 1st in 2006 with greater than 150 mile an hour winds. But for me, that's all I think about in construction now. How would these doors and these windows hold up to the Category 5 Hurricane John? It also reminds me of the time when we were looking for a site in, um, to build our Scantibodies Ethiopia uh, uh, compound. And at first, we looked about 45 miles north of uh, the capital, Addis Ababa, and we were offered a piece of land up there and it looked really nice. You know, it was beautiful. It, it was uh, on a paved road, and only 13% of the roads are paved in Ethiopia, and had trees, and I thought, what's not to like about this place? And, uh, and uh, but then uh, uh, until a local person came over as we were standing there, and he pointed with his finger, and he says, uh, he was explained to us, he says, you know, if you build your building here, and then he pointed about 50 feet away. He says, during the rainy season, your building will float over to here. <laughs> well, that was all we had to hear. And we did some investigation, and we found out that whole area up there in Lake Atafo is all unstable ground. And so, therefore, we, we located about 45, or about three hours south of the capital in Budajira, where, where the ground doesn't move during the rainy season. As a matter of fact, this whole parable of the of building on the rock, we have a demonstration of that right here. When you go outside this building here and you look over there by, next to the chapel you, you, where they're building those thousand uh, apartment units there, you look down that direction on that site and you can see very tall drilling machines. And those drilling machines are drilling large diameter holes all the way down to bedrock they're going to be filled with concrete as columns, and that's what those new apartment buildings are going to be built on because the city of San Diego is telling those builders, you will be a wise builder, and, and you're going to build your house on the rock because the land also has this problem over here. So anyway, so the Pharisees and the Herodians, they called Jesus Christ master only because they heard what, what Jesus was saying, but they were not obeying what Jesus said, and they were... And they were uh, they were putting their houses squarely on the sand. Now, the Pharisees have made a statement that sets them up. Actually, they were trying to set up Christ, but they really set themselves up into a, a perfect position uh, of being the builder who built his house on the sand compared to the builder who built his house on the rock. And it's this statement that they made that's so profound in verse 16, in verse 16, where they said, Master, we know that thou art true. So here they set themselves up because here were the Pharisees saying, we know that thou art true. And that statement is so much like another Pharisee. Here's how they set themselves up. They set themselves up to be compared with another Pharisee who came to Jesus by night and said almost the same words in John 3, 2. John 3, 2, when that Pharisee, whose name was Nicodemus, said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. So the Pharisees in verse 16 say, Master, we know that thou art. And then another Pharisee in, in John 3, 2 said, Rabbi, we know that thou art. 
a teacher come from God. That was, that was Nicodemus. Both called Jesus the leading teacher, rabbi or master. Both said that they knew that Jesus was true or come from God. Both sounded like they were ready and to, to trust and obey Jesus. So then what was the difference between the Pharisees in verse 16 and Nicodemus the Pharisee? For one, it was just words with no heart behind the words. Just like God said in Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much, you can almost see him <laughs> pointing to those people in verse 16. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips they do honor me. They called him master, we know. But have removed their heart far from me. So Jehovah Jesus already had spoken these words about the leaders of the Jewish people hundreds of years before he was standing there as a man, Jesus Christ. And now he stands before the Jewish leaders again, fully seen by them, and they're saying to him in verse 16, Master, we know that thou art true. And as Jesus hears these words being said to him, he's thinking, I already said this. In Isaiah 29, 13, Isaiah 29, 13, this people draw near me with their mouth, but their lips do honor me, but, but they have removed their heart far from me. So the difference between these Pharisees in verse 16 and another Pharisee, Nicodemus, was that these Pharisees in verse 16 had removed their heart far from Christ. And they weren't ready, and, and they were ready to destroy Christ, as a matter of fact. Whereas in contrast, Nicodemus had put his heart very close to Christ so that Nicodemus was ready to put his trust in Christ and obey Christ. So this one Pharisee, Nicodemus, I'm talking about Nicodemus, this one Pharisee, Nicodemus, said one word, just one word, one little word, three-letter word, one word that, 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 that these other Pharisees did not say, this one word, and that one word set the heart of Nicodemus close to Christ, and that one word that the, the, the Pharisees in verse 16 did not say set their hearts worlds apart from Christ. And that one word that Nicodemus said made Nicodemus a true follower of Jesus Christ. The one word Nicodemus said made him a wise man that built his house on the rock. Just one little three-letter word. In John 3, 3, John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? That one three-letter word that, the, that, the, that Nicodemus, the Pharisee, said, set the course of Nicodemus to heaven. And that one little three-letter word that the Pharisees did not say set their course to hell. Just one word. One word that made all the difference between a wise man building his house on the rock and a foolish man building his house on the sand. One little word that set their ha the heart of Nicodemus so close to Christ that he was helped. And that same word that was missing put him so far away. You know what that word was? Yeah. How. 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 That's the word, How. H-O-W, how. That word how makes all the difference between the wise man and the foolish man. Yeah. That word how makes a difference between being close to God and far from God. That word how makes a difference between heaven and hell. It's just that simple. And Nicodemus said that one word how in John 3, 4, when Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus had said, unless a man is born again, he cannot go to heaven. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Because when Nicodemus heard Jesus say in John 3, 3, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus heard Jesus say, in John 3, 3, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except Nicodemus be born again. Nicodemus 
cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus responded in John 3, 4, John 3, 4, how can a man be born again? What he was really saying in John 3, 4, how can Nicodemus be born when Nicodemus is old? See, that's what Nicodemus was saying but to Jesus Christ. He was saying, please tell me how I can be born again. I see I need to be born again, but I don't know how. But, 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 but so please help me by telling me how. And that's why that one word, how, made all the difference for Nicodemus. That was the same way, the same, uh, that, that, that word, word how, it made the difference for you and me. It makes a difference for you and me. That's the same way that the word how should be on our lips when we open the Bible and we go on the hunt for these commands from Christ that we haven't obeyed. We should be just like Nicodemus and, and say that one little word, how, show me how, Lord, how. For example, we go on the hunt for the, in the Bible for commands that we haven't followed. And we find, for example, that Christ says in Matthew 5.44, Matthew 5.44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do, gem, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And our response is the Nicodemus response. How? How, Lord? Please show me which enemies I have. You'll find them, don't worry. Which enemies I have and how I can bless them and that curse me. I don't know how. How can I do good to them that hate me? I don't know how. How can I pray for them that are abusing me? I can't pray from my heart. I hate them. So show me how I can transform. How can I transform for those who are persecuting me? How, Lord, show me how to do this. Help me with the how I can do this. This is the way that the word how set apart the doer from just the hearer of the word. James 1.23. James 1.23. If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man, unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For if he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and, not a, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. So responding to Christ's words with how makes us a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. It's so significant that in verse 16, there was this group of Pharisees who opposed the Lord. It was a group in verse 16. And in John 3, it was just one. It was just one Pharisee, the Nicodemus, who came to Christ with his heart. There's a group in verse 16, and in ver and John 3, 3, there's just one Pharisee. Group of Pharisees, one Pharisee. What it shows us? It shows us that so often, if a person is going to come to Christ, he's got to be willing to step out from the group. He's got to be willing to separate from the group. He's got, and, and this is what Nicodemus did. After Christ died, and his dead body was still on the cross, it was Nicodemus, the only Pharisee that was so visibly seen in John 19, 39. John 19, 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury so we know that the place where Jesus was crucified was a very, very public place. It was like a stage, an elevated stage around Jerusalem, by Jerusalem, seen by many. And when that one Pharisee, Nicodemus, came with Joseph of Arimathea with his hands full of all those burial spices, and when that one person, Nicodemus, set up that ladder on that cross and climbed up that ladder, Nicodemus was saying to the world, you do what you want to me. You say what you want to me. But I'm a worshiper and a follower of Jesus Christ. And he paid a price. There's a price. There's a price to be paid to follow Jesus Christ. And that's the price of separation from the group that rejects Christ. And Nicodemus paid that price. And the Apostle Paul paid that price. And it was a costly price to be paid, but it was worth it. 
it was worth it. Well, then the Pharisees in verse 16, they go on. So, you know, sometimes I can't tell you how, but I just get a real blessing when I'm speaking to defiant, stubborn, lost Jewish people. I get such a blessing sometimes. <laughs> They're trying their best to discourage me, to crush me, but sometimes I walk away so greatly encouraged and, and, and the amazing thing is that it's, it's something they don't even know that they've said, but it blesses my soul. And, and God promised that, actually. He said that when you go to the Jewish people to bless them, God says, I got a, there's a special gift for you. And, uh, and that hasn't changed since it was first made to Abraham in Genesis 12.3, Genesis 12.3, when God said, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You cannot be a better blessing to the Jewish people than when you, in love, bring them the Lord Jesus Christ. You bring the Lord Jesus Christ to them, you bring them to Christ. You can't. And, <clears throat> and you, you try your best to show them how happy they can be in Christ. And sometimes a lost Jewish person will say something that's such a great blessing, this is one of these times, right here. The Pharisees have just said something that is a great blessing. And it says in verse 16, verse 16, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. That's beautiful. Christ teaches the way of God in truth. That's the description of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Beautiful description. He teaches the way of God in truth. In other words, he teaches the, he teaches the true way of God. There's a true way of God. There's a true way of God to come to God. The true way of God to come to God is in John 14, 6. John 14, 6, where Jesus saith, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the true way of God to God. It reminds me uh, uh, of an account of a missionary in Portuguese Angola in the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> John Olford and he had just led an African chief to Christ. And then John Alford asked the chief, he said, Chief, is there another tribe nearby that I could tell about Christ? And, and, uh, and the chief said, oh yes, it's over there, just on the other side of that jungle. So John Olford uh, wanted to go there, and, and he said, Chief, am I gonna get there? And the chief said, no problem. He beat some drums and yelled out something. And he was a big, bare-chested, muscular African man appears, and the chief told him, says, take, take this white man through the jungle over there to the other tribe. So they started out, and John Olford, British man, you know, he has his compass, and he's going everywhere. He's changing, he's taking his compass, you know. As they're going into the thick brush, he can hardly see anything, but he's kind of, and, and so he's following close behind this African, and the, the John Olford's saying, well, they seem to turn this way, they seem to turn that way, you know, he says, he says you know, John Olford started getting discouraged, it's starting to get dark, so he stops the African guide, and he says, now tell me the truth. Do you really know the way through the jungle? <laughs> he says. <laughs> and the African man showed him. He says, he says, uh, you see that machete mark on the tree? And he says, he says, uh, yeah, he says, uh, he says, I made that mark. And, and the African showed him a scar on his arm. He says, you see this scar on my arm? And uh, he says, uh, yeah, and he says, I got cut on this trail going to the tribe. And the African man pointed to the back and he says, you see my back? <laughs> he says, yeah, he says, he, and then he says, Quit trying to find the way yourself. He says, follow my back. He says, I am the way. And that was that. And that's how Jesus Christ says to us. He says, just follow me. He says, he, Christ says, I am the way. And John Ofer, we, 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 he says, John Ofer, he couldn't see the trail that he was going. At times it looked like they were getting nowhere. And Christ in the Bible, it says that we, we can't see the path, but Christ just says, just follow me. I'm the way. And there are many ways that people are taking to try to get to heaven that have nothing to do with Christ. And Christ said of those many ways, or the Bible says about those many ways, Proverbs 16, 25, Proverbs 16, 25, oh, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Those ways without Christ are not the true way of God. They're not the way of God in truth. For example, many try to get to heaven by their good works, and good works is, is not a true way to God because the Bible says in Ephesians 2.8, Ephesians 2.8, by grace you are saved, not of work, through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. And one thing that good works do for a person, it swells the chest. It swells the chest. they got to tell others about the good things that they're doing. And God doesn't like that. He doesn't like boasting. And there were those who were boasting about their good works. About, they were boasting about their, their, their good preaching in Jesus' name. And they were boasting about their good works of casting out devils in Jesus' name. And they were boasting about doing many numerous good works, wonderful works in Jesus' name. But those works was not the true way of God to heaven. In, in Matthew 7, 21, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, or preached, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. See, they were boasting. They were boasting in the years of Christ about all the good works they did. They said, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did mighty wonderful works in your name. Doing those good works was a way that seemed right to them to get into heaven. But good works was not the true way of God to heaven, not the way of God in truth. So to try to use good works to get into heaven is a way of death. There's a way. Proverbs 16, 25, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The true way of God, the true way of God, the way of God in truth, as the Pharisees put it, to get to heaven <clears throat> is Acts 16, 31. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. To believe on is, to, is, is different from, it, 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 it's, it's to rely on Jesus Christ. It's to depend on Jesus Christ. It's to trust on Jesus Christ. Rely on his death as sufficient to pardon from sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins. We just rely on it. That's all. Depend on Jesus Christ to cleanse us from our sins. Make us ready for heaven. Ephesians 5.26, Ephesians 5.26, that Christ might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Revelation 1.5, Revelation 1.5, him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Christ's blood is enough, it's sufficient to cleanse us from our sins. We just depend on it. We just depend on the blood of Christ to cleanse us. We trust in Christ to take us to heaven. John 14, John 14, 1. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Genesis 49.10, Genesis 49.10, he's called Shiloh there. Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Christ said he's going to bring us to heaven. The Bible says he's, we're going to be gathered together to Christ. We just simply trust him to do it. That's the true way of God to heaven. Now comes the ultimate setup when the Pharisees say to Christ in, in verse 16, verse 16, Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. And when the Pharisees said that, that Christ did not care or take notice of any person, we can just imagine the Pharisees looking over to those Herodians, the spies for Herod. And in essence, they were saying to Christ, we know you wouldn't even alter your statements just because these Herodians happen to be here. They said that because the Herodians were loyal to Caesar, and so anything that Christ said against Caesar would be picked up by the Herodians and reported back to the authorities. And now that those Pharisees have set up the stage, they've set up Christ, they've set up the stage for the trap, here comes the question. In verse 16, verse 16, tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? So they're saying, tell us. They're saying, 
we're, we're going to ask you a really direct question, a really straight question, and we don't want you to dodge the question. Just tell us. In other words, don't try to hide your answer from us. Just come right out and tell us. And they said, what thinkest thou? They're saying to Christ, tell us what you think. Don't tell us what others say about paying taxes to Caesar. The tribute money was excessive for the people. The term Caesar referred to all the Roman rulers, not just the one back in Rome. The Roman ruler that ruled over that area at that time was called Tiberius, and he was hated by all the Jews because he threw these lavish, immoral parties very expensive, and that's what the Jews' taxes went to pay for. So the Pharisees knew that if Christ said that it was lawful to pay the Roman taxes, that they would have heard Christ say that the people should pay the money to, su to support that disgusting character of Tiberius. And, and the Pharisees knew that if Christ said that it was not lawful to, to pay the Roman taxes, that the Herodians would have carried that report right on back to the Roman authorities. So the Pharisees are very, very comfortable here. They think, well, we've just, we, we've got it made now. They, re they, think they, they, we, they, they say to themselves, we really got Christ on this one. We've got Jesus trapped. And you can feel the tension that's in the air with this question. It was intense. So the Lord Jesus hears their words, but louder than their words is the perception of their intention, which is wickedness. Matthew calls what Christ perceived their wickedness. The Greek word, Greek word for wickedness means plot. Plot. They had plotted against him in his mind. Luke calls it, uh, in Luke 20, 23, Luke 20, 23, he perceived their craftiness, their craftiness, and said unto them, why tempt you me? The Greek word used for craftiness means trickery. He tricked them. They were trying to trick him. He knew they were trying to trick him. This, uh, the, this is the same Greek word that's translated, crafting, this is translated subtlety in 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That means that Christ saw in their question the same trickery that the serpent used in the Garden of Eden to bring man into sin. And Mark called it, in Mark 12, 15, Mark 12, 15, shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, hypocrisy, said unto them, why tempt me, bring me a penny? The Greek word for hypocrisy means play acting. They were just play acting. He saw they weren't sincerely asking about whether or not to pay taxes to Caesar. They were just being actors on a stage. They were playing a role. And so now, with one question, Christ so elegantly unmasks the play actors. And he asked them in verse 18, verse 18, why tempt you me, ye hypocrites? It's very important that we understand how he asked that question. He didn't ask them that question with a spirit of condemnation. Why are you tempting me, you, you no good, rotten hypocrites? He didn't do that. Because John 3, 6, 17, John 3, 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't say that to them to condemn them. He said that to them with the spirit of saving them, a spirit of helping them, as if he was saying to them, I don't really get it. Why are you fighting against me? Because I'm your only hope of salvation. It's the same as before when, 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 when he, as Jehovah Jesus, said to them in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18.31, Ezekiel 18.31, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? It's totally unnecessary. Every person that's cast into hell, it wasn't necessary. Ezekiel 33.11, Ezekiel 33.11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? It reminds me again of uh, another interchange with an Orthodox rabbi this last week where he sent me a video of a famous uh, Jewish rabbi, and he wrote me, he says, Tom, Tom, he says, look at how beautiful is our heritage. 
please don't abandon your people. And I wrote him back. I said, look at how beautiful is Jesus Christ. Please don't abandon your only hope. So in this question, Christ is asking them why they're trying to destroy him because he's their only hope of getting into heaven. And so now comes his response with this one response. His opponents just walk away. They're finished. They're defeated. In verse 19, verse 19, show me the tribute money. And they brought him a penny. He saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. When they heard these the words, they marveled and left him and went their way. There's only one word to describe what Christ did and said in that scene right there. And the word is, in verse 22, verse 22, marveled. It was marvelous. This whole scene as it rolled out, was nothing less than just marvelous. Marvelous in this scene as we stand back and we're just amazed what he did, what he said. Because with an absolute calm, so much tension in the air, they want to kill him. He just asked to see a coin. The coin's minted by the Roman government and on the coin is the image of Caesar. And so he asks, who's that? And they say, well, that's Caesar's. So the idea is that if the image on the coin is Caesar's, then he said, the coin must belong to Caesar. So he says, give Caesar his coin back. And that was marvelous at how he didn't just stop there with that statement. But he progressed on to a whole new realm of thought. He really triggered their thinking when he said in verse 21, verse 21, and unto God the things that are God's. And when he said that, everyone's head must be spinning because no one saw that coming. That totally blindsided them. Because the question that he didn't state, but he strongly implied was, what has God's image on it? And the answer to that question is Genesis 1.27. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So then after establishing that man has God's image on him, he's leading to them the same conclusion. Well, since God's image is on man, then man belongs to God. So give back to God what belongs to God. The wisdom in that answer was just, it's astounding. It's so marvelous. And that's who Christ is. Psalm 105, verse 5. Psalm 105, verse 5. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Amen. There's nobody like you. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.